All right, we're going to wind up talking about thromboembolic diseases, blood clots. And uh, the, the big ones that we see, we see DIC in a whole variety of scenarios. I'll leave that for another discussion. Uh, the, the big true clots that we deal with tend to be a saddle thrombus and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy where again that turbulence that we get in the ventricle from the septal hypertrophy uh, tends to form thrombi and that can break loose and go anywhere, brain, liver, kidney, but it tends to hit the uh, iliacs and lodge there and cut off blood flow to the rear legs. The other big one, and probably we see this one more commonly than that one just because we don't see as much hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and that's immune-mediated hemolytic anemia. Uh, once we get an IMHA here, if they don't die of anemia, we can give them blood transfusions. The most common cause of death in an IMHA is a pulmonary thromboembolism. Okay. <clears throat> and the, the bad thing about that is because it's an immune-mediated disease, we have to treat them with a steroid, and steroids are pro-coagulatory. We know in Cushing's disease, one of the signs of Cushing's disease, if you will, is sudden death. And the sudden death is from pulmonary thromboembolism because of the pro-coagulatory effect of steroids. So we've got a rock and a hard place on IMHA. We've got IMHA that wants to cause a, a thrombus to form on its own, then we add a steroid to it on top of that. So we really are, are prone, so we oftentimes add anticoagulants when we're dealing with IMHAs. And we're trying to uh, decrease our thrombus formation without causing hemorrhage. That's the tricky part, all right? So we get an anticoagulant effect where we don't uh, form a clot or at least we don't allow a clot to progress any further and allow the body to slowly re resorb it uh, without interfering with normal clot formation uh, and hemorrhage. And we do this by two basic approaches. Either we're going to uh, decrease platelet adhesion or we're going to interfere with the clotting factors. Okay. Now I'm going to uh, uh, talk about both those approaches. <coughs> and uh, this is the good part where it was kind of like when I taught physiology and I showed you the, the Krebs cycle and then told you you didn't have to know it. Okay, this is the same thing. You don't really have to know this chart, but it, it makes a point that we use aspirin and clopidogrel, uh, Plavix. Aspirin and Plavix are our two antiplatelet drugs that we use, okay? And <clears throat> they work differently. There, there are two main aggregators of platelets, things that trigger platelets to um, clump. One is... Uh, thromboxane, which is a prostaglandin analog, okay, so uh, you'll recall the arachidonic acid cascade, uh, we get our um, fatty acids in the cell membrane converted to arachidonic acid, and then cyclooxygenase takes those on to prostaglandins, including uh, thromboxane and prostacyclin. So aspirin blocks that uh, cyclooxygenase so the platelet doesn't get uh, activated. The other big trigger is ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and Plavix, it's just easier to say than clopidogrel. Uh, I'll eventually get it, but uh, it works by blocking um, ADP, okay? So those are the two. They're both given orally, sometimes used together. Now, um, if, if you follow human medicine, you know they use, uh, quote, low-dose aspirin to prevent strokes and people that have had heart attacks. The low-dose, interestingly, is not just to minimize side effects. It actually works better as an anticoagulant at low doses than at high doses. All right, and, and the reason of that is you normally have a balancing act going on between uh, platelets 
that are activated by throm um, thromboxane and the endothelium of the vessel releasing prostacycline, which is a natural anticoagulant. All right. So you've got an endogenous coagulant and an endogenous anticoagulant. When you give aspirin, the unique thing you're, uh, about aspirin is it's a permanent inactivation of cyclooxygenase. Okay, the enzyme is permanently inactivated. All right. Well, in most of the body, including the endothelium, you've got a nucleus, so it can generate new cyclooxygenase that's not inactivated. The platelet, remember, though, has lost its nucleus. All right, so it, no long, it can no longer generate new uh, thromboxane. So the thromboxane that was inhibited by that aspirin is permanently inhibited. The only way you get rid of the effect of aspirin on a platelet is to replace the platelet. Okay. <clears throat> so we actually use low doses instead of higher doses. Now we've worked that out kind of in the dog. Again, you don't have to know this, but Dr. Mackin's group is heavy into um, clots and uh, one mg per kg per day in the dog inhibited platelets in like 70 or 80 percent of the dog so now I think they're using two mg per kg. We still haven't worked it out in cats as to what a low dose of aspirin is there. All right. And this is our, our main antiplatelet drug. You'll see some clinicians add uh, the clopidra uh, grail to it. Okay, now a um, couple of things. Um, in human medicine, they divide clots into what are called red clots and white clots. And white clots are primarily platelet in composition and they occur mostly on the arterial side. Red clots have, uh, are mostly on the venous side and are more fibrin, red cells, a whole mix of things in there. So in human medicine, they talk about these mostly being for white clot prevention. Okay, we don't draw that distinction. They do affect both sides, all right, but wherever the platelet predominates, this is gonna have the most effect, okay. Now, uh, you'll see this used in IMHA, particularly in a variety of other things. I hate to say it, but we don't have a lot of data that supports that. Um, we're really lacking, not that it doesn't, just that we haven't proved that it does, okay? There uh, was one clinical trial that looked at Plavix in IMHA, and it, uh, azathioprine and Plavix did lower the um, rate, but they didn't have it with just the azathioprine. In other words, they compared the, re the response rate of azathioprine and Plavix versus azathioprine and aspirin. So it was as good as aspirin, but we don't know what, that it was better than just azathioprine. And there's also a study that looked at, at and showed low dose aspirin helped in IMHA uh, <coughs> in that study, but it was not a clinical trial, it was a retrospective study. So they, again, don't have any po uh, negative controls in that. Uh, so there's a general feeling that the antiplatelet drugs are beneficial in IMHA, which is the main condition we use it in, uh, <coughs> but the data is not as solid as you might think it is in, as in human medicine. All right, now the other way that we prevent thrombus formation is by inhibiting clotting factors. You only have to know how two of these work. You need to know that heparin inhibits thrombin down here in factor 10A, and anoxaparin, which is a low molecular weight heparin, only inhibits factor 10A. Okay. Now I'm gonna talk about these others kind of so you're familiar with them, but you don't have to know how they work. Okay, so <clears throat> the main way we use either the heparin or the anoxaparin. All right, now heparin has been around for ages. 
uh, it actually activates antithrombin-3 to promote the normal uh, anticoagulant effects in the body. And that in turn inactivates thrombin in factor 10A. So you take the normal anticoagulant factors and you amplify them about a thousand fold by giving heparin. Always, you never give it IM, you're too likely to get a hematoma. Uh, so we give it sub-Q with a very small needle. Uh, it's one of the few drugs that doesn't cross the placenta. Uh, it is a way, if, if the dam needs an anticoagulant and you don't want to risk the fetus, heparin is kind of unique in that regard. Uh, it won't cross the placenta. Now, in small animals, I'll talk about anoxaparin because this largely replaced regular heparin. When I say heparin here, it's often called unfractionated heparin. It's got a mix of molecular weights and it inhibits both the thrombin and the 10A. Because of cost, we'll still use it in horses. Uh, particularly laminitis, we don't understand the pathophysiology of laminitis yet totally, but we know that uh, thrombi do form in the vessels in the hoof wall and the lamina, so it's not uncommon for heparin to be given to horses prophylactically to try to prevent laminitis. And one of the things they're really prone, it can occur in any species, but there is a phenomenon called heparin-induced agglutination, where the, the red cells, this is not to do with the anticoagulant effect, the red cells start clumping together and they can get pulled out by the spleen when they do that and they can get anemic. So when we put uh, animals, in this case horses, on heparin, we monitor their PCV. We're monitoring not only because we want to detect any low PCVs from hemorrhage, we're wanting to detect any low PCVs from autoagglutination because we may have to stop the heparin because of that. It does carry some risk of accidental hemorrhage. Uh, it is harder to regulate heparin than it is anoxaparin, okay? There are standard doses of heparin out there that you can use. In fact, one called a mini dose, which is obviously lower than the standard dose. The best way to do it is, though, is to get a baseline PT or PTT. Remember, the, the heparin's interfering with those. And then from that baseline, you adjust your heparin dose till the PT is about one and a half to two times baseline. And that ought to put you in the range of, of appropriate anticoagulation with minimal risk of accidental uh, hemorrhage. Okay. If you get into danger, there is an actual reversal agent called protamine. All right. You may have heard of protamine zinc insulin. That's the same drug. It's just used for a different purpose. But protamine can, uh, comes uh, as a sole product, and it will reverse heparin. A few years back in human medicine, uh, there was a company that made 1,000 unit per mil heparin and 10,000 unit per mil heparin. And they did a, a, a box change, and it wasn't at all obvious that one was different than the other and there were a lot of human deaths from uh, uh, hospitals thinking they were using 1,000 unit per mil heparin when they were using 10,000 unit per mil heparin. And they, they wound up running all over the place trying to find protamine for those uh, overdoses. But if you get into trouble, you can reverse it. Now, uh, as I said, heparin is a mix of uh, molecular weights. They discovered if they uh, separate this out, the low molecular weight heparins, and there's several, anoxaparin is just the most common one we use, okay? These are called fractionated heparins. They only inactivate factor 10A, not thrombin. So they have a higher therapeutic index. Uh, so we can use anoxaparin and not have to worry about monitoring the PT or PTT and we don't worry nearly as much about accidental hemorrhage. Yeah, we wouldn't want to take them to surgery while they're on an oxyparin and so forth, and they are prone, but nowhere nearly as much. Uh, it is a lot more expensive. Um, I did the kinetic work on it with Dr. Lunsford and Mackin, and in humans, you dose this twice a day. It requires four times dosing, four times daily in the dog, unfortunately. 
so that doesn't help. And it's not as easily reversed with protamine if you get into trouble. But largely, uh, anoxaparin here has replaced heparin in small animals. And uh, when I see an IMHA in ICU, I really like to see them on anoxaparin. You'll see them on aspirin, you'll see them on Plavix, you'll see them on aspirin and Plavix, but I really prefer anoxaparin to prevent PTEs over the, the two. And that's just my clinical impression. That's, there's no sound data to say that I'm right, even though I think I am. <laughs> All right. So um, you're responsible for that. Uh, you're not responsible for warfarin as a uh, therapeutic agent because we almost never use it for that. All right. You know it as a poison, rat poison, okay? But for decades, it's been used as an anticoagulant in human medicine therapeutically. People with artificial valves, people with AFib, which are prone to thrombo thromboembolic disease, have been on warfarin. So yes, grandma was on rat poison, okay? <coughs> uh, uh, it is reversible with vitamin K. It's largely been replaced by better vitamin K rodenticides from a toxicology standpoint. You'll cover those with Dr. Gaunt, I'm sure. Um, uh, it's to address what has been called a warfarin-resistant rat. And it's kind of interesting. A warfarin-resistant rat just means it's a smart rat that figured out that my friend ate that and died. <laughs> so I'm not going to eat that. That's a warfarin resistant rat. It's not a physiologic resistance to warfarin. Okay, um, Dr. Jim Miller was the first dean. He was involved in, in actually owned part of the patent on warfarin and got many millions of dollars from it, supposedly. A lot, a lot of money anyway. But he was saying one day, he said, mice are easy, mice will eat anything. <laughs> he said, rats figure it out. So. They have gone to second generation rodenticides where a single dose, a single ingestion will kill them instead of having to have multiple ingestions of warfarin. But it is a mainstay uh, in human medicine. So atrial fib, ischemic scrub valves, uh, deep vein thrombosis. But it, uh, as uh, you might guess, it has a small therapeutic index. It's really easy to overdose it, and it's really persnickety. Uh, if the, the human eats a lot of leafy vegetables, their PT goes uh, uh, all uh, awry because there's vitamin K in leafy vegetables. Uh, so they have to uh, control the diet of these individuals very closely uh, and monitor. It's really hard on some of these patients to get them at the right level of anticoagulant uh, with warfarin. Also, it's highly protein bound, so a lot of drug interactions. When I originally wrote this, I said ne never use therapeutically in veterinary medicine. Then I read a paper that Dr. Lunsford had done a review, and she mentioned some hypothetical places it might be used, so I had to say seldom. Uh, <laughs> I have been doing this 35 years, and I've never seen warfarin used therapeutically. All right, but it is a possibility. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned to you when I talked about mitral valve disease in dogs that you can replace the valve surgically. That's doable. The problem is you couldn't keep them alive because of the anticoagulation difficulties, and that was warfarin. They couldn't ever get them regulated uh, on warfarin. All right. So, and warfarin at one time, just kind of FYI, there was a theory that navicular disease was from thrombi, uh, thrombi in the navicular bone. Uh, so it was kind of in vogue during the 60s to put uh, navicular horses on warfarin. Uh, that's gone, gone away a long time ago. So, wrapping up on cardiovascular, talking about anticoagulants. And I just presented uh, on warfarin. And we don't use it therapeutically. Um, <clears throat> from that aspect, you don't need to know. What I do want you to know about warfarin is that it is a vitamin K antagonist anticoagulant, mainly used as a rodenticide, although that's historical. It's been replaced by second-generation vitamin K antagonists. 
But the main thing from a therapeutic standpoint, the reason we don't use it is A, it has a small therapeutic index, and B, it's extremely hard to, to get the dose correct. It requires constant monitoring of the PT or PTT and dosage adjustments. It's not a once and done scenario. So <clears throat> largely we don't use warfarin in veterinary medicine as an anticoagulant. Now this slide you really are, are not responsible for. I have it up here because you can't turn on the TV uh, without seeing an ad for one of these particular drugs here. Zarelto, Pradaxa, uh, several of them. These are newer uh, anticoagulants uh, <clears throat> with a much better safety margin, a, a higher therapeutic index than warfarin. Uh, the um, uh, Zarelto and some of these uh, are oral factor 10A inhibitors. So although they're totally different drugs, they work a lot like anoxaparin. They're just an oral uh, product. This one is a thrombin inhibitor. So uh, <clears throat> the whole push when you see these advertisements, and it is true they have a larger therapeutic index and they don't require the frequent monitoring of blood to adjust the dose. Uh, <clears throat> and that's a very nice thing. They're not affected by diet the way warfarin is. Again, in humans, the diet, the amount of vitamin K in the diet can affect uh, the warfarin dose. The major drawback is the physicians really like the fact that warfarin had a reversal agent. If they got into trouble, they could give vitamin K. And that has been lacking when these were first introduced. Uh, uh, <clears throat> individual companies have come along, there are at least a couple now, that have monoclonal antibody antidotes for their product, okay? So if you get into a bleeding problem uh, while they're on one of these, you can reverse at least that particular product. I read some research and, and there's some promising um, products out there that are more universal reversing agents for these. Uh, but uh, you, I think you will see these eventually showing up in veterinary medicine, but I just wanted to make you aware of them. Uh, so you're not responsible for this particular slide. Okay. Now lastly, I want to talk about thrombolytics, which are different than an anticoagulant. An anticoagulant is preventing clot formation or preventing progression of clot formation, but it, we rely on the body's own endogenous uh, thrombolytics to dissolve that clot. What we're doing with the thrombolytic is we're giving exogenous substances that activate the body's normal thrombolytic pathways. Particularly, there are these agents right here that activate plasminogen into plasmin, and plasmin is our active clot buster, okay? So it degrades the fibrin in the clot, uh, <coughs> and we actually uh, dissolve it. You don't have to know these. Uh, these were historical. These have been around for a long time. Streptokinase actually was isolated from certain strains of streptococcus uh, bacteria. And that's in part one of their pathogenic mechanisms is while the body is trying to wall off the bacteria, trap it in a clot, the streptococcus is dissolving the clot. Uh, <coughs> uh, but these are largely uh, not used because of a low therapeutic index. Uh, these last two are the ones in common use, and the one I want you to know is kind of the generic name, tissue plasminogen activator or tissue plasminogen activating factor. Uh, <coughs> um, our TPA is the common lingo. All right, so this is a true clot buster. Uh, its main use is in human medicine for myocardial infarcts, heart attacks, and ischemic strokes, possibly other thromboembolic events. For example, it could be used in pulmonary thromboembolism. The data supporting that as, as worthwhile is somewhat controversial, but for heart attacks and ischemic strokes, <coughs> um, they are very useful if given in time. There is a time factor where you, these have to be given before permanent damage occurs. Uh, <clears throat> so that's why getting to a good emergency room 
this sort of thing is important so they know what they're doing. It's also actually another uh, product is approved to salvage catheters and vascular access ports. Uh, I have done this uh, <clears throat> where you know we're down to one vein on a dog and I, <laughs> normally if a catheter occludes with a blood clot we just replace the catheter. But when you're down to one vein what do you do or if it's a vascular access port. You know, a vascular access port is an implanted catheter with the hub under the skin and you use a special needle to go through the skin to access the port. It's used a lot in chemotherapy patients. Well, you can't go in and just replace those willy-nilly. So you can buy um, <coughs> TPA in these small doses where you inject it into the catheter, give it a little time, and it uh, dissolves the clot and you get your catheter back. I have done that. Uh, why haven't we used it? Uh, one, thromboembolism, we see two major uh, indications of pulmonary thromboembolism, which uh, <coughs> I've mentioned is it's the, the data is not clear as to how effective it is, uh, whether it's worthwhile, and it's also extremely expensive. We're typically talking thousands of dollars. Uh, to treat an animal with TPA, uh, moderate-sized dog. It was going to be the panacea. It was going to allow us to, to cure saddle thrombus in cats. If you know hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, they get the um, thrombus cutting loose and it tends to lodge at the iliacs and actually there's a cat down there right now that has uh, uh, no ability to use its rear legs because it has a saddle thrombus. So we were going to dissolve these clots and, and restore the cat, and it didn't work out. The problem is we don't get these early. Remember I said that, that there's a window for uh, heart attacks and strokes. When they tried to use these in, in saddle thrombus, most of the cats died from reperfusion injuries. So uh, th those rear limbs are, are getting no blood supply just enough to keep uh, uh, from, from rotting, basically. So uh, you go in and you bust that clot with TPA, and all of a sudden you get this rush of uh, fibrin degradation products, potassium uh, in high concentrations, all sorts of toxins and cytokines, and they would die of shock uh, <coughs> from a reperfusion injury. And the ones that didn't die of shock tended to reoccur because they still had the uh, cardiomyopathy. So uh, it was a nice idea that just didn't work out. Uh, as I said, uh, I might consider it in a PTE, but it's very expensive. And you always have to worry about iatrogenic bleeding. One of my best friends, who's actually a physician himself, uh, had an ischemic uh, stroke. And so they gave him TPA and it immediately relieved the, the signs within just a short period. And then a little while later, he developed a hemorrhagic stroke. Uh, <coughs> uh, he was, fell into that like 10 or 15 percent of individuals that moved from one to the other as a side effect of the TPA. So the only uh, use that I, I really uh, am familiar with in veterinary medicine uh, that is pretty well accepted is in ophthalmology, and that's for hyphema, blood in the anterior chamber. When you get uh, blood in the anterior chamber of the eye, whether that's from trauma or other uh, courses, and, and um, if Dr. Bette Bees hasn't talked to you already, she will about hyphema. But of course, it, it has the risk of blocking the outflow channels, and then you get glaucoma uh, if that occurs. So there is a protocol for taking TPA and injecting it into uh, the anterior chamber to dissolve the clot and decrease your risk of um, glaucoma from that. So that, that's a lot of information. Any questions on anything I've covered uh, on the anticoagulants?